Everybody, I'm Ron Scheidemantel. I'm the Dean of Students here at Bluefield State. Thanks so much for being here today. I think as you all know, uh, this is Black History Month in February. We've had a series of programs throughout the month. We still have a couple more to go. Uh, we have the Hamilton Hatter, the first annual Hamilton Hatter Luncheon next Friday. You're all welcome to attend that. That's in celebration of one of our founders here at Bluefield State. Uh, we're excited about that program. We're excited about the program here today. We have an awesome keynote speaker here for Black History Month. And to those of you that are watching via YouTube live streaming, thanks for being here. For those of you that are in the room, we appreciate that you're wearing your masks. That's important. And kudos for you for all doing that. I don't see anybody out there that doesn't have their mask on. I think I'm the only one in the room that I'm up here in the front, and I've got it on my ear. Uh, to introduce our keynote speaker for Black History Month is one of our outstanding faculty uh, administrators and teachers in the classroom. Our, one of our premier uh, faculty members in the Department of History. Everybody, please give it up for Rodney Montague. I brought them to say that. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to, um, to be here today and to speak and to introduce our keynote speaker for Black History Month. Uh, what I really wanted to start off with was a quote from his own book. <laughs> you know, in his book, Dr. Cicero Fain III wrote that quote, community was no notion. It was a foundational force in our lives, demonstrated in intergenerational, interclass alliances and associations linking and binding us. It existed in the lives and deeds of African-American teachers, postal workers, Preachers, parishioners, hustlers, and I have to appreciate this, and players. I did appreciate that. <laughs> Who shaped our lives in explicit and subtle ways. He said the story of Black Huntington was a story of agency. I think he summed up perfectly Black History Month. It was through the exercising of such agency, people who fought, led, and asserted themselves that African Americans moved from the slave fields to the White House. Those of us who are scholars who research the lives, thoughts, and experiences of African Americans know this all too well. Dr. Fain III, in pursuit of this, has received a PhD in history. He's the recipient of the Carter G. Woodson Fellowship. He's now at Marshall. In his book, which was published by University of Illinois Press, is an examination of the critical role African Americans played in the development of Huntington, West Virginia. It's called Black Huntington. He continued to advocate, as he so eloquently so uh, just was telling us, he continues to advocate for the acknowledgement, the recognition, and celebration of African-American ancestors, including the likes, one of my personal favorites, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, one of the godfathers, if you will, of Black History Month, for which we are gathered here today. It is my esteemed honor, it is a privilege, to introduce Bluefield State College's keynote speaker for Black History Month, Dr. Cicero Fain III. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Dr. Montag. Doc, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ron. Simon, the deans of the various colleges, uh, David McMillan for actually initiating this um, this endeavor. My my invitation. Um, this is my first time to Bluefield State, even though I'm aware of the rich history. Uh, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you for the privilege of being your keynote speaker. Um, I was gone out of, I'm, I'm born and raised in Huntington, West Virginia, fourth generation black Huntingtonian. I'm exceedingly proud of that fact. I've been the beneficiary of traveling around the world. My previous industry was, uh, I was in the airline industry for about 11 years, 12 years, uh, international flight attendant and purser and trainer. Um, but I never, ever left 
West Virginia. Never ever left Fairfield West district of Huntington West by God. Um, and I'm just delighted to be back. Um, and so I will say this about my book. And this is a, uh, an encouragement for anyone else out there. There's still stories to be told. When I started my dissertation, I had no idea that, that, that it would transform into a book. And from what I want to understand, I'm one of the few people, um, very, few, very few historians take a dissertation and it goes right into a book form. So I'm exceedingly gratified for that. Um, I never, the entirety of the time that I'm writing this thing, I never ever envisioned you just don't know what to think. You don't know what the, what the reception will be. You don't know if it's going to have legs, wings, or it's just going to sit like a brick. Um, and so for me to be two years out from his publication and still be giving these kind of talks is an affirmation that these stories matter. These stories matter. And so um, I'll start off with this one. Uh, this. This is really about, I, I was having, the, and I want to thank folks for the lunch as well. It was a really delightful conversation, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives, spend time with me. I'm going to concentrate really on uh, intergenerational transition or occurrence that takes place that really starts off with the first black migrants into uh, West Virginia and the, and the, and the tri state region of uh, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, and the foundational aspects or elements of their, of their experience and their drive. It really is an intergenerational uh, story, first generation of labor, labor class, working class, that then, that then produces a, a professional class. Um, and and each of them, each of these particular uh, generations, each contribute to Huntington uh, the, and, and the tri-state region, the development and the, and the growth of, the, of, that, of, those, um, uh, of that region significantly. So um, the story really starts off with the fact that in the Black folks would travel from Central Virginia up through West Virginia, and this is really prior to, I should say, this, this is stuff, let's imagine this is all Virginia still. Um, you're going to have the James River Canal Turnpike, which will be Virginia State Road, which will turn into the Chesapeake, Ohio Railroad. Oops, excuse me. There. And then uh, will come the US 60 and the Midland Trail, all of these incarnation of this road. Here's Huntington. It should be known that here's the, here's the River Jordan, the Ohio River, and then here's Ironton, a uh, place where we call Burlington. And so this is free territory back in the antebellum era. This is slave territory. This would have been called Charleston, Virginia, famous for its Kanawha salt mines at that time. Huntington is not, does not exist in the antebellum era. Huntington is founded in 1871. But I at least wanted to give you some idea of this migratory pattern that takes place. Now, these folks, in large measure, have always been, in some degree, entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurship refers to the process of creating a new enterprise and bearing any of its risk with the view of making the profit. But they're also engaged in the spirit. And I would say that the willpower, strength of purpose, the Holy Spirit, the life force of a person, enthusiasm, the soul of a person, in large measure, the drivers of, of my lecture and of the development of this entrepreneurship that takes place are going to be folks steeped in religious foundation. Now, when I get to, we're going to talk about, oh, and one thing I forgot, there's going to be a church, I'm going to talk about a Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, I'll get to that. 
I'm going to start off, when we talk about Huntington, it's important to realize that even though Huntington, Huntington is established in 1871, black people were still, of course, there were slaves in Cabell County, which is where Huntington is. There were slaves and free blacks. But importantly, there was also a residential black population in Lawrence County, which is just across the river. Lawrence County, as you can see, positioned adjacent to the Ohio River, is going to be a key player on the Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad also passes through, parts of it passes through Cabell County and Wayne County and West Virginia, Boyd County and Greenham County and Kentucky. It's important to realize that this church, Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, is the mother church of the tri-state region. And the tri-state region would be uh, southeast Kentucky, excuse me, northeast Kentucky, southwest Ohio, and southwest West Virginia. Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church is founded in 1813. It is as I said, Burlington, Ohio is literally about a four mile walk from Huntington. Because back in the day, you either took, you folks would walk from Huntington, we're talking really after Huntington is established. But Missionary Missionary Baptist Church is essentially, when it's first founded in 1821, excuse me, it is the Providence Anti-Slavery Missionary Baptist Church Association. And so parishioners of this church are going to be key players within the Underground Railroad network. They're going to form the black churches in Macedonia, Big Rock, and Black Fork, Ohio. The Providence Regular Missionary Baptist Church is formed in 1833. It morphs into that uh, in, in, in 1833 to become the Providence Missionary Baptist Association. By 1886, this association comprised 28 ordained ministers and 24 licensed. Essentially, this is the foundation. This is the ground zero for the spreading of the faith. Not only religious teachings, but also the fact that the pastors who are part of this, the ministers that are part of this association, would travel from church to church, spreading the gospel, getting to know folks, developing networks, and talking about strategies and tactics and opportunities that existed in their circumstance. They were driven by not only the spirit to spread the gospel, but also by the necessity that they lived in a capitalist society and we gotta deal with that. This is the organizational data of the member churches. So we see that if it's founded in 1813, there's a black presence there in 1813 in Macedonia, Trolley Creek Hill, Ohio. You got Paint Creek, you got these other churches throughout the greater Ohio, uh, Southern Ohio. But you see here also that in 1872, First Baptist Church is founded in Huntington. Nelson Barnett, one of the first black migrants to Huntington, is going to be the first, one of the first pastors, pastors here. Nelson Barnett will arrive in about 1871 in conjunction with the railroad being built. Railroad, Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad being built from Richmond, Virginia, through the New River Valley, coming in through Charleston and then coming to Huntington. Huntington is going to be the last stop on the railroad for time. It is a transshipment point. At one point in time, 5,000 black workers, 5,000 black laborers lived and worked in, in a, the proximity of Huntington. And many of these folks after the railroad would be constructed in 1873 would settle into towns and hollows and villages along the railroad. You also have these churches that are being built and established. All of this part of the association. And so in essence then, this is, these are entrepreneurial activities. Okay? Churches, yes, we know the primary purpose of a church, but churches don't exist if they can't make money. They may exist, well, let's take that back. 
it depends on how you define a church. If we're talking about an edifice, then you're not gonna, you got to have some way to build that edifice. And so part of what's going on is these pastors, these preachers, are creating a network and utilizing that network, network to help build churches as an entrepreneurial act, endeavor. Here we go with the underground, excuse me, with the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Following along what I just talked about, US 60, Midland Trail, James River, James River Kanawha Turnpike. Here's the N and W. You folks are probably more familiar with this one. But you see it stops here. That's Huntington. Over here across the river is Burlington and Macedonia Church right over there. I was actually just in Macedonia Church oh, about a month ago. It's still there. They are endeavoring to, they just received a grant to uh, refurbish it. It is the oldest church, I believe, west of the Ohio River. By the way, in Gallup Police, Ohio, just above Huntington, is the oldest African Methodist Episcopal Church west of the Ohio River. And so what happens then is you've got this, because of the Chesapeake and Ohio River, because of the work that can be uh, uh, performed in conjunction with it, you've got a massive influx of black folks from throughout Virginia and throughout the region that comes to South, Southern Virginia, excuse me, Southern West Virginia and settle into Huntington and, and the surrounding environs. Folks know about John Henry, the black working class in the CNO Road. Here's a perfect example of it. These folks are working long hours, arduous conditions. The truth of the matter is, without black labor, the Chesapeake and Ohio River would not have been built. So, Remember, Huntington is established in 1871. It is, you know, um, it's a village. One of the things I wanted to do was kind of give you some insight into what's going on in terms of occupations. So nine years after Huntington is formed, these are these, the, the data that is associated with Huntington's African-American population. For the most part, the vast majority of the folks, both male and female, are unskilled. Seventy-seven percent of the labor force is unskilled labor. So they're working at the bottom of the occupational ladders, whatever endeavor they're doing. Now, it should be said that and we're going to get to that a little bit later on. Just because we have evidence of a formal economy doesn't mean that black folks aren't engaged in an informal economy that is not being recorded. See, the wonderful thing about black folks and, and really a lot of immigrant groups um, is that they, have in, they are industrious. And their entrepreneurship takes them sometimes into an alternative economy that doesn't go on the record books that aren't chronicled in the city directories, so to speak. You know, your little gin joint, haunt, vice den, whatever you want to call it, entrepreneurial activities that exist, that have always existed. Bake sales, cookie thing, cookie uh, sales, um, farmer's markets, those kinds of things. So to supplement their income, black people are engaging in all types of entrepreneurial activities. But we won't, we won't see it here, chronicled. And by the way, black women are key to this as well. We can see the, the, the sense of dependency that exists for many black women in, this, in, this, in the burgeoning economy. 76, well, let's go with 58% of them are housekeepers or keeper of a house. 
This is essentially in their own domestic arena or the, or the domestic arena. Domestic servicing means that they're working for somebody else. So in essence, then, there aren't many, either there, there aren't many occupational alternatives currently available to black women. So thus, they concentrate then on the home, on the home front. And remember now, we're only, we're still basically not that far removed from slavery in 1880. Huntington, we, it will establish a school um, around 18, I believe Barnett comes in about 1875. Huntington establishes his own school. Black churches are starting, they're starting to have black institutions that, that, that bubble up. But we can see here, by the time we get to 20 years after the founding, there is some, some movement forward. The acquisition of, of a larger sector of skilled and semi-skilled workers. We also begin to have a 2%, we only have one person with two, three people involved in entrepreneurship, but that's progress. More important, I think, is we get a broadening out. We have a sense of the, the developing and growing entrepreneur activities that exist now. Boarding house, running a boarding house, chambermaid, cook, domestic servant, yes, but ironer, laundress, washerwoman. This is ex women have expanding opportunities. Black women have expanding opportunities. Now, what is going on also is that with the development of black institutions. I mentioned a gentleman by the name of Nelson Barnett. Nelson Barnett is going to be, as I said, one of the first black migrants to come to Huntington. He's going to, in essence, develop a somewhat what you might call a farm cooperative that exists, kind of like an independent grocers association, in which black farmers get together and say, you know something, we're going to cooperate in selling our goods within this cooperative because it benefits us to, to align our objectives and goals and to, and to cooperate together. And, and Nelson Barnett is going to travel. Not only is he traveling throughout that church network that I mentioned before, but he's also traveling. Part of his goal is to recruit folks to this farmer's network. Because, again, many of the folks that are, many, many of the first black migrants are religious folks. Church is their bedrock. Okay, but hey, look, if you are working, if you are part of a laboring class and you're trying to build a homestead, stabilize your income, send your kids to school, you, all those things, you, you're not going to have very much money to give to the church. And so a way to supplement that would be to have these farmer cooperatives, and then part of that money will go to the various churches. To help supplement. And it really is a smart idea, I think. And it's successful, as we see by the growth in the churches that takes place. Nelson Barnett's story is symptomatic of the story of, of many of the first black families that come to Huntington. And I'm going to get to them a little bit later on. He's, he's his son. One of his sons is going to be a doctor. Another son is going to become the principal of Douglas High School. In fact, Barnett School still exists in Huntington, named after Nelson Barnett. Unfortunately, it's on the it's fallen on hard times, and it's probably going to be sold and destroyed. Um, his daughter, Josephine Barnett, would teach at Douglas High School for 40 years. So this, his family is going to rep, be representative of the first wave of black professionals that exist in Huntington. We have a growing black population. Significantly, they're still unskilled. 
But look at this professional class that has all of a sudden appeared. We didn't see that anywhere else prior to now. So now we have a black professional class born out of the second generation of folks that have been in Huntington. We have a service industry now that is developing, but we still have a significant number of folks that are unskilled. And that's gonna be a challenge. Now, importantly, 84, 55% of the women are at home. What does that tell you? Anyone have an answer? Family life is more important, but they also tell you that they don't necessarily need to work. That the income that the male is making is sufficient to allow her to stay home. And so that should give you some idea of the, the fact that the, the home life in many of these uh, black families the stability there is there. The economic stability is there. So that the women then don't have to go out and work. I'm sure they're doing some, they're doing some work in addition to the homework, but they're all, they don't necessarily, at least by these figures, aren't forced to go out. It should be said that against this backdrop of 1900, we have Jim Crow era going on. In the, in the state of West Virginia, it was called benevolent segregation. And essentially, the state abided, well, let me say this. The state, race relations were much more cordial in West Virginia, unquestionably. And the state did establish um, black, separate black institutions. And so there was a commitment by the state to recognize that we're going to try our best to observe separate but equal and really mean it in, in terms of relaying resources, sufficient resources, equitable resources to black institutions. But that doesn't necessarily explain what's going on in the social arena. The social arena is a different environment, totally. And so the benevolent segregation that the state espouses to doesn't mean that white citizens of Huntington and the region believe in the same type of mentality or stance. And there are certainly, as black people become more and more embedded within the city, more and more embedded within industry, there are going to be race, uh, issues of race relations. And so the question is, well, how do black people deal with it in Huntington? Certainly, they don't have the numbers to really impact any significant political change in a municipal level. Just like in large part, black people have never had the political clout to, to change politics at the state level. And so black people in Huntington, black, Huntington's black population decides really, they make a strategic decision that we can't really impact things politically, so we're going to concentrate on black institutions, the assurance of black institutions, and the, and the connections and the networking that exists between black fraternal organizations, black churches, black schools, I mean, the first exposure I got to Bluefield State College was really reading about the glorious athletic history that the football team had um, and participating in winning national championships. Folks do know that, right? You do know that, yeah, okay. Just wanna make sure. This is my man, Dan Hill. He's on the cover of my book. He's the first taxi driver, first black taxi driver in Huntington, 1905. Um, by 1925, he owns his own, actually it's about 1919, he owns his own home and is a member of, I think he has a, a position within the municipal government. 
he's he's indicative of black progress black entrepreneurial activities this gentleman professor J.W. Scott arrives in the Huntington around 19 early 1900s um, learned man from uh, a, a, a county in Virginia um, he's of the position he and he he writes a he writes a pamphlet that I have in my possession. It's really a, a, um, a remarkable piece of work, and I'll get to another another aspect of it. But he, he really critiques the working class um, efforts. He harshly critiques them, and 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 the reason why this is important because uh, the reason why I bring it up is because. He, he, he embodies a, a growing black middle class that is looking down upon the black working class. What we call black stratification, economic stratification. His critique is essentially that the first generation of black laborers, the first generation of black migrants who came into Huntington, didn't really, they weren't strategic in the, in the way they, they matriculated into this new situation. And he says, we have gotten out of the cellar, so to speak, and that means much. Our eyes are beginning to open. The proverbial short-sightedness of the first Negro settlers who refused to buy real estate when land was cheap was a racial blunder for which we suffer today. Yet a few who brought their families or who married out here were wise enough to buy homes. Well, sure, but I want to critique him. Remember, these folks, the, the masses of black folks who arrived in the Huntington, the masses of black folks who arrived in to Bluefield, or the masses of black folks who arrived in the Beckley, had no education, had no money, had no skills, and you're asking them to adjust and adapt to a new environment and somehow in the blink of an eye buy property? I think that's kind of ridiculous. Oh, it, it, maybe not ridiculous, it's a heck of a challenge. Okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Now, one thing he did do that I, I think was really fascinating, and I think it even has relevance to today, he gave his maxims of good citizenship. Because in essence, what black people are doing during this era is not only are they trying to make strides, you know, b build themselves up by the bootstraps and establish um, stable homesteads and, and get a job, but they're also trying to be good citizens so they convince white Americans and white city leaders we're worthy. You know, we, we want to show that we have just the right stuff, just as like anybody else, that we're committed to, good, to being good citizens, to, to what makes America great or this city great. And so, his maxims are this, have an object in view. And this, for the young folks here, the students here, I think this is, I think this is relevant. Have an object in view. Be systematic. Always pay cash. Man, I wish I'd have come across this when I was a college student because I'm telling you, my debt load is serious. And my son, I don't know what the heck is going on with him. Be honest. Never borrow for small things. Don't gamble. Leave liquor and tobacco severely alone. Live the simple life. Work as hard to save as to make. Trust in God and keep busy. And so again, we come back to religion and the gospel and, and entrepreneurial the spirit.
I think these maxims are on point. So, by the time we get to about 1950, 1920, thereabout, we have a stable, and for the most part, a stable black professional class that has benefited mightily from the efforts of the black working class that preceded them. I mean, the two go hand in hand. Unfortunately, this is kind of difficult to read. But I interviewed a gentleman by the name of uh, Walter Myers um, before he passed. Um, I believe it was Walter Myers III. Uh, and he said that, talking about what, you know, how, how, do, how do black people deal with the fact that they were locked out of politics, they were in large measure locked out of purchasing property where they wanted to because there was restrictive covenants going on at this era restrictive covenants block black people from buying land where they wanted to buy land. And so they had to go out and buy land in the hinterlands outside of the city. And so black people made the decision. Some black folks said, okay, well, if I can't get to property A, I'll go to property B. And so that's what they did. He talks about his, his uh, my father and aunts told me that the most of the blacks could not buy property in what is known as the Flatlands from the Guyan River to 12 Pole Creek. This is essentially what we now call Huntington, the, the main part of Huntington. If anyone has been to Huntington, there's an area called Ritter Park. Beautiful park. Um, um, Twelve Pole Creek passes through. No, that Four Pole Creek, excuse me. I'm getting them mixed up. Um, so we're talking about Huntington. And so in large measure, black people really had a difficult time. They were purchasing property in like the core business district, what we would call, uh, south of the railroad tracks. Um, but they they were locked out of, they wanted farmland, really, is what they wanted. They didn't want necessarily land within the, the city environment, uh, the urban, urbanizing environment. So the flatlands were farmlands all through this area, and they brought property along Fifth Street Hill, Spring Hill and Walnut Hills. They lived in all of that area up until nearly the 30s. They had hundreds of acres out there, beautiful land. It's still beautiful land. My grandparents owned most of Walnut Hills area, and a lady named Mrs. Black owned from the boulevard, Al Group Boulevard, um, back, back past 18th Street. She owned all of that area. In the far right, in addition to, to purchasing lots in Central City and Huntington, some of the conjunction with her husband, C.S. McLean, during the late 1890s and early 1900s, Mary E. McLean purchased two one-acre plots of land behind Spring Hill Cemetery adjacent to Norway Avenue, one in 1907, the other in 1914, on which Bethel, Bethel Crossroads Cemetery will be established. By 1920, Bethel served as the primary burial site for C.S. McLean and Fred, his 18-year-old son, who were Huntington's first black undertakers, again, entrepreneurs. The reason why I'm really, um, I mentioned the Bethel Cemetery is that it's now called Bethel Memorial Park Cemetery. Um, my great grandparents are buried there. I just literally found this out within the past year, year and a half. Um, we have, I shouldn't say we, while I was away, community members, leaders at Marshall University um, conducted sonar surveys of, that, of the cemetery, found an additional 600 to 800 bodies interred there. On Friday, a local a gentleman by the name of Chris Miller, who runs um, Dutch Miller Automobile Group, and I think he filed for governor, will be running for governor, donated $50,000 because there was, a, there was a former sanctuary there. He donated $50,000 to help rebuild the sanctuary, and we're going to, I'm invo involved in an effort to make this a heritage site, um, hopefully by next year. Um, and so this is the kind of history that I think still resonates. This is why I wrote Black Huntington. I talked about Nelson Barnett's son, Dr. C.C. Barnett, Barnett Hospital and Nursing School. 
Um, in my mind, I think this is his establishment of the nurse of the Barnett uh, Hospital, which building still stands, by the way, on 7th Avenue in Huntington. And we're in, in, involved in the effort to help uh, refurbish and renovate that. Um, I attest that growing assertiveness, increasing cultural maturation, and racial solidarity exist in this, the, this era, the second generation. Development of black professional class, teachers, doctors, attorneys, and barbers, a maturation of black institutions, churches, benevolent and fraternal organizations, and Douglas High School. And there also was a what we call the black hospital movement in, in which black doctors started black hospitals. Um, he created the Black Dr. Barnett Hospital, and he also, with the help of his uh, second wife, Clara Matthews Barnett, created a nursing school. His hospital was one of the only six accredited to train surgeons in America. His graduates would go on to, and, and work at Boston University and Tuskegee Institute. The nurses would, would be all over would travel off and, and garner jobs across America. We also would have the establishment of, of a colored orphan's home that existed. Um, there will be a, an example of this uh, uh, increasing assertiveness is the fact that black people would move out into the public arena. Remember I talked about the social arena that existed in, in the Jim Crow era and benevolent? Well, you know, that means that in essence there was an expectation amongst many whites that you step off you step out of my way when I'm coming down. You step off the sidewalk or whatever. Some type of act of deference. Well, black people said enough of that crap. And so they began to assert themselves into the public arena. They would have what we call grand cake walks, dancing competitions, with you, and the winner would go off with the, with the cake. At one point, there was a grand cake walk that involved 5,000 black people from Ironton, Ohio, Ashton, Kentucky, and Huntington. Now, that may be some exaggeration, but even if it was 2,500, that's a lot of folk dancing for a cake. There are also going to be an increase in black female-centered endeavors and activism that takes place during this era. And there are going to be an increase in political activity and agitation. There's going to be the establishment of a colored independent Republican ticket. There's going to be the establishment of the West Virginia spokesman, a black newspaper. So, one of the more interesting developments that takes place is the development of this Washington place, a black only housing subdivision that was, this is 16th Street, this is now the, what we call Howard Grove Boulevard. Um, this would be 10th Avenue. These would be part of the houses that we would be purchased, that would be designated. And part of the establishment of, of it's an interesting thing, I would, I would contend. Part of the establishment of Washington Place is twofold. Number one, it allows black people to purchase property within the city, within a black-centric environment. But it also allows white people to say they're buying land, they're forced to buy land there so we don't have to worry about them moving out into our area. So if we make the land available for them to buy here, then we don't have to worry about them coming out to where we are. And so, Black people do buy property here. Around this time, Nelson Barnett and his family owned five, I think about seven properties. Not necessarily all here, but within the Black Fairfield West District. They own seven properties. Okay? So folks are utilizing home ownership as their vehicle to move up the economic ladder. Now, interestingly enough, it also allows those black folks, the black middle class, who can purchase land here to say, you know something? I can do that and not have to worry about the black working class. 
So in some event, it's almost as if this is kind of like a, the first instance of a gated community kind of vibe. I mean, trust me, black people want to have nice stuff too, and we don't want to be bothered by riffraff either. So black people do buy here. But what, ha what they do, though, is they challenge its designation as a black-only enclave. Which, and by the way, they had a black only enclave here in Bluefield they tried to get established. I think it was established. Because they didn't want that to be, uh, they did not want to be identified with that type of designation as a black only. They didn't want to give white, the white builders and the white, white real estate agents that type of satisfaction. Now, unfortunately, let me see here. This is 19, this is 1920. So we've got, what we have then is a broadening out of the black entrepreneurial spirit, black economic stability. Um, and we see it in terms of 1920, this, this development of black-owned businesses in 1920. We have eight contractors, six barbers, five hairdressing emporiums, four pressing and cleaning shops, three real estate agents, two shoe repair shops, two printing companies, one drugstore, and one movie theater. I mean, that's a pretty nice set of circumstances for any community. How many people, by the way, are there any hairdressing emporiums in Bluefield right now? So what, what do black women do for, with their hair then? I mean, because I, I gave this presentation at Glenville State, and they're in the same boat. It's a tough situation. This, this is not, I, I don't mean to, to, to make light of this. If you want to have black people coming and staying, or staying, and returning, you got to have these type of places for them to take advantage of, to go to. And not just black people, you know, it's about expanding out inclusion and diversity as much as you can. In Huntington, we got 50,000 people, let's say roughly, a little bit less than that. But, I, you know, there's no place to pick up Spanish spices or, you know, you know. No, definitely no place to pick up West African cuisine. And so you have these conversations with folks from the international arena or coming from other, who are from other ethnicities, and they say, you know something, Professor Fain? Yeah, I, I got to travel up to Columbus or Cincinnati. Two and a half hour drive. That, that's going to work against many people saying, you know something, I'm going to be here for the long term. Why don't I just move to Cincinnati or Columbus, matter of fact? So, property acquisition. What is fascinating, in my opinion, is this term right here. Vigorous interracial ownership campaign. Meaning, black and white got together, strategized, and said, you know something? We're going to engage in efforts that benefit all of us to move forward economically. Now, I, don't, I haven't done a lot of research in this arena, but I would be really curious as, as to what other cities in this time period engaged in interracial cooperation to achieve aims that are going to benefit black folk. Results in the purchase of 67 homes and lots throughout the city. Success mitigates the need to establish building and loan associations. So you know what a building and loan association does? Well, for one thing, they're, in the, they're in, engaged in it to make money. They loan you money at a percentage, right? And so, controlled by whites. 
And so, and, and to mitigate, to circumvent the problematic endeavor, they said, you know something? Why don't we just, let's coalesce our own talent and energy and monies and develop tactics and strategies that will allow us to move forward. And they do it. By 1924, 60%, 60%, think about that, of Afro Huntingtonians owned their homes, a higher figure than either the black residents of Clarksville or Charleston. The aggregate worth of black real estate holdings was approximately $1,400,000, a significant increase from the roughly 400,000 total wealth cited by President Scott a decade earlier. I mean, it's just a shame what has happened to Huntington. I'm sure you folks look with regret on, or, or um, sadness on what has happened to Bluefield and other major metropolitan areas within the state. I mean, it, it, all of us are not immune from what has taken place in the broader economic picture and downturn. But at this particular moment, this particular time, and think about how optimistic you would have been if you were living in that city. The place is bumping. People are coming from Charleston, Pikeville, Kentucky, Ashley, Kentucky, Burlington, Ohio, all these little villages and hollers coming to Huntington, the big city. And trust me, in my doing my research, Huntington was the big city. People would come through, they pass, take the train in, and they would see the 16 foot, uh, I mean, 16 story skyscraper or something. They thought they'd arrived in New York City. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny to say, but it, it's true. If people, I mean, many, many people still live in small towns. And to travel to Huntington, I had one person tell me, we, I mean, even this is more recent. You know, in the big cities, you have like uh, the crosswalks that are diagonal. Well, you know, as, as opposed to going, you know, person told me, says, yeah, first time I came to Huntington, I saw the, my first diagonal crosswalk. I thought I was in New York or Japan or Tokyo. Who knew? In any event, of the 483 homes own average number of rooms per house, 5.5. That means you're not living in a shanty. You're living in a nice home. As opposed to the average number of persons per household, this is within this is the city average, 3.9, which is 1.2 less. So you know, um, they this is they're living in nice, comfortable situations. They're not living in a shanty. They're not, they're not living in what uh, shotgun shacks. In essence, prosperity. Is spreading far and wide. Oh, in 1926, to give you some idea, my, my book, by the way, goes from 1871 to 1929. Huntington's founded in 1871. It becomes the largest city in the state by 1929. Unfortunately, you can, uh, the blue it bleeds out. But what it says is in 1926, the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a black newspaper of the era, sent its chief correspondent who had covered World War II, no, excuse me, covered World War I. He travels throughout West Virginia. He comes to Beckley and Bluefield and Charleston. Um, I believe up to Wheeling as well. And he, you know, he basically chronicles the black experience in those particular cities. And he says, uh, his name is George S. Schuler. He reiterated that the positive portray, portrait of Black Huntington's progress in writing, quote, over 60% of the colored families own their houses in which they live. Most of the Negroes have steady work on the railroad in the big shops of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Many work steadily for the municipality, collecting garbage and trash, and there are close to 50 barbers who don't appear to be clasping the lean hand of want. Moreover, their relations between whites and Negroes are very cordial, and Negro businesses can always count upon the patronage of whites in West Virginia 
no matter how strong the spirit of the Ku Klux Klan may be otherwise. And so, that's essentially where we end my story, on a note of positivity. Um, I think Huntington represents, Black Huntington represents a remarkable story. Um, I'm really gratified that I did the story then. Um, and I reach out to you, those, those historians out here who may be thinking of doing uh, uh, some story. Do it now, if at all possible. I could not do my, I could not do my story, I could not have done Black Huntington the way I did it if I hadn't have done it then. Because people passed on, and I would have lost documents, I would have lost the stories. I thank you. Okay, let me see if I can get this thing to actually. Yes, sir. I can't get it to move. Yes. He, good question, thank you. He's going to come over. We actually have a day at the Shack Community Center in Huntington. I used to play basketball there and run around all the time. Uh, we used to have so many games there. Uh, he came into Huntington. He's going to become uh, the principal of Douglas High School. And with C.H. Barnett's son, C.C. Barnett, excuse me, what's the problem? Let me rephrase it. With C.C. Barnett's son, a brother, to C.H. Barnett. James W. Scott and C.H. Barnett are going to become the principal of Douglas High School. They're going to start a newspaper, the West Virginia Spokesman, I do believe. But because of the politics, politics, the school board says you will either stop that newspaper or we will remove you from your position. They refuse, they are removed. Who steps into their stead is no other than Carnegie Woodson who becomes then the principal of Douglas High School. First black man of state parentage to get a PhD, who graduated from, from Douglas High School, who started Negro History Month, who started the Association for the African American uh, Study of uh, Life and History, who wrote at least 33 books, um, and is arguably the greatest, one of the greatest historians, in arguably, one of the greatest historians ever. Um, and of course, a hero of mine, and whose shoulders I stand upon. Does that help you? Thank, good question. Thank you, sir. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fain, we want to present you with this Bluefield State College mug. Thank you. As a gift of appreciation thank for you. being nice. here today. Nice. You know, gang, uh, President Capehart and Provost Lewis and the Division of Student Affairs are committed to programs like this here at Bluefield State. Uh, we're, com we're committed to Black History Month and bringing in outstanding speakers. One of the reasons we're so committed to these programs is because we have, as you all know, outstanding, outstanding students here at Bluefield State College. And we're committed to make sure that they have a well-rounded experience. One of the reasons why we know they're going to have a well-rounded experience here on the Hill is because of our alumni. We have outstanding alumni that have done terrific service in the community, not just here in West Virginia, but all over the globe. And so our goal, and my goal as the Dean of Students, is to make sure that our students have that experience, continue to have that experience, and can leave here with these valuable degrees and go on to do the terrific things that our alumni have done here at Bluefield State over the last 100 plus years. And for Dr. Fain to be here with us just for a few hours today to contribute to that mission and to be a part of educating our students, in my opinion and in the opinion of Dr. Uh, Lewis and President Capehart is outstanding. So thank you for being here today. Thanks for supporting this program. You're gonna see a lot more from us in the future. And what, what's the last thing I always say? That's it, go Big Blue. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks Dr. Fain.